Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to, uh, this is pediatric ophthalmology style grand rounds. We're going to do case presentations and uh, first uh, up is uh, Dr. Dries who's uh, uh, lately uh, become uh, uh, quite the expert on superior oblique dysfunction, surgery, and everything associated with it. He's going to share some of the wisdom that he's gathered. Thanks. Thank you, Bob, and good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm trying to present something that will interest you with quite a bit of information and uh, fairly quickly. So what if I told you that the superior oblique muscle was not just one muscle, but rather two? And indeed, it kind of is. There are muscle compartments in multiple extraocular muscles. And this morning I'd like to talk about the compartments of the superior oblique and what that means clinically for diagnosis and surgical management. Thank you to Dr. Uh, Joseph Diemer at UCLA and Steve Archer at the University of Michigan for helping me with figures in uh, multiple discussions over the more recent years. Here, you're looking at the histology of the superior oblique muscle belly with multiple cuts starting posteriorly and then the cuts march anteriorly. And the two colors correspond to two branches of the trochlear nerve. This green color innervates here purple-ish color here, and here's a reconstruction of selective separate innervation of the two compartments of the superior oblique. Separate innervation, make sure they have them totally separate. Yes. So what does that mean clinically for diagnosis and surgical management? Well, we do need to talk just a bit about motor physiology of the superior oblique. As we all know, about the axes of rotation. The superior oblique is an intorter, an abductor, and a depressor. So here are a few diagrams. This is the vertical act axis about which the eye rotates horizontally. That gets you oriented as to the position of the superior oblique tendon with regard to that axis. And you'll have to think about the other axes, sagittal and horizontal as well. This is in primary gaze, and it makes sense that this muscle has those three functions. What about in down gaze? Well, it does change a bit. It's a better intorter and abductor in down gaze, and that's in large part because, simply put, the muscle just pulls harder. But the superior oblique does have this unique anatomy, we all know, with an origin at the apex of the orbit, coursing anteriorly and curving around the trochlea, and then tendon fibers fanning out in the globe. And in down gaze here, actually here, this is the eye in down gaze, you can't see the cornea very well. And it's kind of hard to understand why the muscles are better in toward an abductor. So let's view the eye in down gaze 30 degrees forward. If you saw the movie The Matrix, they were fighting and they would freeze and then the camera would pan over to a different perspective. That's what this view is like here. So the eye is in down gaze. Look what happens to the relationship between the belly of the superior oblique and the tendon. This is more or less perpendicular. Here it's more acute. And if you look at the vertical axis, you can see the position of the tendon has changed with regard to that axis, making a, a better abductor in down gaze. And the tendon is more at the equatorial position, giving it better in torsion and down gaze. The contribution from this unique anatomy is only about 5 to 15% increased in torsion and abduction. Mostly it's that the muscle's just pulling harder. So what does this mean clinically? Well, what's it like to have torsional diplopia? This is what it's like to have torsional diplopia. This is a 55-year-old photographer who supplied this photoshopped photo of what it's like to walk down stairs at an apartment complex. And um, I would just like to show you in this diagram the compartments of the muscle. There's a lateral compartment of the superior oblique and a medial compartment. The lateral compartment, its tendons insert on the posterior fibers of the tendon, and the medial compartments inserts on the more equatorial anterior fibers. So the lateral compartment has more depression, and the medial compartment has more intorsion. 
the case here is um, a lady mainly with tons of torsion. Okay, so you think maybe this is a selective medial compartment paresis. One could speculate. She has lots of torsion, eight degrees in primary gaze, but much more in down gaze, 15 degrees. Really makes sense that those anterior fibers are affected, right, in the medial compartment. And look at her uh, vertical deviation. It's really not that big. It's really quite small. And there's not much incompetence in down gaze. So the posterior fibers of the tendon probably are less affected. Probably the lateral compartment is less affected. So what surgery should, would, would help her because she's suffering? Prism isn't going to work. Well, let's go back to the 20th century and talk, talk about the Harada Ito procedure. Initially devised by Japanese Dr. Harada, Dr. Ito, just to anteriorize the front tendons of the superior oblique, but later Fells modified it by splitting the tendon and transposing these fibers temporally and anteriorly on the globe, giving them a better mechanical advantage to in torsion. How did it work? Well, quite well. Her extorsion is two in primary gaze, six in down gaze. She still has her hypertropia. Initially, she fused two weeks out, but three months later, she did have trouble controlling her diplopia again, especially in down gaze. Luckily, a small amount of vertical prism, and she was fusing, and she likes spectacles in the first place, and she's happy. So does she have a selective medial compartment superior oblique paresis? One can speculate, but we really don't have dynamic MRI that will really tell us this in these patients at this point. Let me just talk about one more case. I think this is bilateral, and maybe even a bilateral medial compartment trochlear paresis. A 60-year-old female director of medical directors at the University of Utah, torsional and vertical diplopia with a small head tilt going back to the teenage years, but it worsened recently after she had cataract surgery, which often happens with clarity of vision in patients with pre-existing strabismus. She had diplopia when driving and when reading. Let's look at her exam. Bit more complex than the last one, but look at how much torsion there is. 15 degrees in primary gaze, 16 degrees in down gaze. That is a lot of torsion. And let's look at her exam. Again, a hypertropia that's not large without much incompetence, which would argue that the posterior tendon fibers of the superior oblique and the lateral compartment probably are not as affected. She does have a V pattern and an esotropia in primary gaze. She doesn't have classic three-step Parks-Bielschowski testing for superior oblique paresis, but I think she probably has a mass bilateral superior oblique paresis. When patients are this complex, you gotta break down the deviation. You gotta treat their extorsion, their esotropia with their V pattern, and their hypertropia. A superior oblique tuck might have, might have been a good choice, but I chose not to do that because she had such little incompetence of her hypertropia, and her hypertropia was small and down gaze. So instead, for her hypertropia, a contralateral inferior rectus recession is my procedure of choice, the yoke muscle of the predic superior oblique. She also has the esotropia with the V pattern. She needed a medial rectus recession, one half tendon with infraplacement for the V pattern. But keep in mind, when you transpose recti muscles, you induce torsion. And if you infraplace the medial recti, you're going to make her extorsion worse. So she had a bilateral Harada Ito, bilateral with the goal of creating 15 to 20 degrees of mechanical encyclotorsion under general anesthesia, which we can do with a Mendez ring. The refractive surgeons know what that is, and the strabismus surgeons are beginning to learn about it because you can mark the lid, mark the limbus, do your surgery, change torsion, and measure how much you got mechanically. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to do this, but this seems to be the most convenient and easiest for me. So, how did she do? She was fusing in all gaze positions except for extreme down gaze. Her extorsion was five degrees in primary gaze, five in down gaze. Um, so, she did very well. And mainly, uh, the point here is, you know, could she have a bilateral medial compartment superior oblique paresis? So, what if I asked you, does the superior oblique muscle have two compartments? Well, you probably say yes. Thank you.
Next, Tara Hahn, resident currently on the pediatric alcohol, initially about our next patient, and then I'm going to have some comments as well. So um, this is an 18-month-old boy who um, at uh, birth developed infantile spasms and was noted to have unilateral hemimegalencephaly, which is an enlargement of one cerebral hemisphere. He had a left hemispherectomy, um, but despite this, he had persistent seizures. Um, after a vagal nerve stimulator and starting the ketogenic diet, this helped, but he still has about 20 seizures per day, which is better than about 100 that he was having before. His mother had a normal pregnancy, um, normal ultrasounds, no known infections during pregnancy, and he was born full term. Um, there's no family history of seizures, no neuro neurodevelopmental or genetic diseases that run in the family. And his developmental history, as you would expect, he's developmentally delayed. Um, he's able to sit with support, he can throw objects, and he likes toys that have lighted buttons. Um, he can't say any words, but does communicate his um, likes and dislikes with sounds. Um, th this is a list of the medications that he's on. Um, as you can see, he's on Sabril or Vigabitrin, and we'll be talking more about that. Um, because of um, uh, his use of Sabril, um, it was recommended that he get um, eye exams. Um, unfortunately, the first exam that he got was just uh, VP and ERG without an EUA. So the first time that we're seeing him is um, in April of 2018. In the clinic, he has wandering eye movements and XT. And then um, for his EUA, his pressure is 7, 12, and this is a cycloplegic retinoscopy. And so as I said, in 2017, he had a um, VP and ERG without, without the associated EUA. So we do have a comparison point. And that you can see that his uh, P100 amplitude um, is slightly better back in 2017, but this wasn't under anesthesia, so probably pretty comparable. And this is single flash um, ERG, um, and you can see that he has uh, decreased B wave amplitude. Um, and this is 30 hertz um, testing the cones, and he has a very poor cone response bilaterally, um, as he did back in 2017. Thanks, Tara. Oh, which one's yours? Can you? That's it, right there. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so. This issue of Igabit, you know, the question at, at this point with his child when he was, came down here from Montana was, is there evidence of Igabitrin toxicity? And uh, we typically do an exam under anesthesia, do electrophysiology. It turns out that many years ago when this drug was studied, Don Creel and I were among the investigators that participated in gathering data uh, that brought to the fore the issue of igabitrin toxicity in children. And in this child, uh, that is uh, you know, definitely an issue. And the thing that was striking with our exam under anesthesia uh, was these changes, depigmented areas from mid-peripheral retina out to the periphery, the optic nerve notably looks healthy. We, because of issues getting tests accomplished, did not get an OCT during our recent exam in our anesthesia, uh, but we did do the electrophysiology that you saw. And the thing that struck me with that electrophysiology was that the cone uh, ERG, the flicker response, which is predominantly a cone response, all we saw were stimulus spikes. That was a grossly abnormal electroretinogram. The manufacturer of Sabril has recommended that testing be done every three months, including electrophysiology in all children on the medication. We have held the line in doing it here every six months, recently incorporated doing OCT. It turns out that retinal nerve fiber layer thinning has been identified as another component of this toxicity. 
in looking into this, there are a couple of things with this kit, and I want to show you some of the pictures. These are these areas of depigmentation that are present, and fortunately, the posterior pole looks relatively normal. One of the questions here is, is this sabral toxicity? And I apologize for the uh, flashing. I have no idea how to operate this when it works, let alone how to troubleshoot it. Um, so if anyone has a clue, uh, please jump in. Any of the residents, as far as is, you know, if we were to consider other things, what else should we consider? You've got an abnormal electroretinogram in an infant who's got borderline poor vision and some pigmentary retinal changes. RP. RP could be some sort of retinal dystrophy. The other question in a child who's got abnormal neurologic function is, is in my mind, was is there some evidence of a metabolic disease? It turns out that we have him scheduled to see Dr. Longo, who is our pediatric geneticist metabolic specialist. So we will hopefully have answers on that. In the interim, the plan quite uh, you know, forcefully to pediatric neurology was let's taper him off of Vigabitrin while we were sorting this out. We are going to bring him back at our next exam. We will do an OCT and we'll have more information. In terms of looking into this, what have we learned and what have I learned in putting this together for you? It turns out that Vigabitrin is an irreversible inhibitor of GABA aminotransferase and when you have increased GABA, you have decreased seizure activity. Where is it most frequently used? At least 90% of the patients that I see this medication used in have tuberous sclerosis. Why is it the magic bullet for seizures in, in TS? That is an unknown. Now, the ERG changes that Dr. Creel identified years ago include a decrease in the cone B wave, decreased in flicker amplitude, and the thing that most people remember is absence of oscillatory potentials, those little spikes you see on the elevated portion of the B wave in the electroretinogram. Nasal uh, ret optic atrophy and nasal retinal, kind of segmental uh, retinal atrophy were described by Ray Bunsick at Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto back in 2004 for monitoring, again, electroretinogram, fundus photos, and OCT. Now, one thing I learned that I was not aware of is this has been associated with a cumulative dose, greater than 1,500 grams of drug. So we're going to need to start recording that when we see kids. We've not been doing that. The other issue is question of does this have long-term implications? And there are at least two papers suggesting that it indeed does. In adolescents with documented cerebral toxicity early in childhood, when they were seen later, when one could do a Goldmine visual field um, and uh, um, do OCT looking carefully at nerve fiber layer thickness, there are abnormalities seen in adolescents from documented toxicity early in childhood. This is years off. Say. Years down the road. And, and this is really opening a can of worms. And then the other issue is these authors, uh, and this is a, 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 a French group of investigators published in Pediatric Neurology presented VEP and ERG stimuli to selected parts of the retina. And what they found were that there were issues in the peripheral parts of the retina that, they were, that were abnormal when presenting these uh, this, uh, uh, flashes, both VEP and ERG, uh, in school-aged children who had been exposed years earlier. And these were school-aged children who had been on the medication that did not have documented toxicity. So there's real question about this and reason for us to be following these kids closely. And so uh, now setting that aside, I want to, one other thing, you're in clinic, it's very busy, you get a text. And the text is from one of your radiology colleagues. And the text basically just says, what is this? and do you need to see the patient today? And here is the scan, and, and this is the, the only image I got, and yes, it was this fuzzy on my cell phone, and you see what looks like a lens here, and a lens here, and not much of an anterior chamber. And so, I'm wondering, is this a child with anterior segment dysgenesis that they've discovered? 
say, tell me more about the patient. It turns out that the patient is a healthy 12-year-old girl, head injured, CT from an outside hospital, reported to have perfectly normal eye exams, good visual acuity by mom. And this was an artifact. And I, I don't know in retrospect whether he sent this to me as a joke or seriously asking a question, but you know, wanna, when things don't look right, you want to wonder about the source of the information. And back to the first case, questions, comments, particularly from our retina colleagues in neuro-ophthalmology as far as this issue of bigabitrin toxicity. Well, what percentage of all patients on, on this medication do you think end up having toxicity? We, we talk and this is an extremely rare occurrence. This is a rare occurrence. It, it's a rare occurrence. When we were doing, they are doing the initial treatment trials and we were doing electrophysiology, they were using much higher doses. The doses they're using now are much lower and I have, this is the first patient in recent memory that I have recommended that they stop the medication. Almost all the other patients we've been on have had good electrophysiology and we've had good stable electrophysiology. And again, the issue with this first ERG to understand is when you put a patient under general anesthesia, it suppresses the EEG. When you suppress the EEG, you decrease the response that you're gonna get with electroretinogram and particularly with the VEP. So that anesthesia can alter it. So comparing an awake study to an asleep study is not necessarily a good thing to do and draw firm conclusions. Yes? In addition to the outer to the uh, neurofibrillary change, do you actually see any outer change with the OCD? Not that I am aware of. Clearly, clearly the RPE looks like it's being impacted. Yeah, this is, if this is due to vigabitrin, this looks like RPE. And the other thing I'm gonna do when we go back next with this child, and they've gotta come down from Montana and we have to coordinate care, is I think it'd be wise to do an FA. We can easily do that now with the RETCAM, um, and uh, Glenn Jenkins has been very good about coming to do FAs for us um, and, and helping us through that, uh, both with peds retina and pediatric ophthalmology services and doing an FA I think would help sort out where this is. The other thing I thought as far as the metabolic disease was this, could it be gyrate atrophy or something like that? And, but there you've got loss of choroid. This does not look to me like loss of choroid. It looks like simple loss of RPE. I've never seen anything look just like this in any of the patients that I've either seen in person or published with vigabitrin toxicity. So I think the important thing is that the finding that this, this indeed is, can be uh, a permanent change in the permanent loss of damage. So it, well, and it, and it definitely knows how advanced that could be if somebody doesn't pick this up. And then right. It could extend and be very well, the other plea I would make is that rather than having someone order the test, I think that having someone look at the eyes carefully and thoughtfully um, is is highly uh, desirable in terms of trying to sort these things out. Yes. I mean, the hard thing I think about Sabrel is it's it's an amazing drug for a lot of kids, and so it's not like I mean, the, you, in some cases you have to have the discussion with parents. Would you like to take them off this drug, which is the only drug that can control their seizures? Or uh, the the trouble I've had with this drug is that when I put them under anesthesia and do these repeat ERGs. Sometimes they'll get a little lower, sometimes they're a little higher, and some of it, a lot of it has to do with under anesthesia. Um, uh, they're a little bit different, and it depends on how light the anesthesia is. And so I have trouble sorting that out, and these are usually very um, delayed children who you can't get much of an exam in clinic. And so it's hard to know that, but it is, a, uh, you know, if it's really getting lower and you look at their exam in clinic, and is it really worth putting these kids under anesthesia because uh, these are kids with lots of other developmental problems. Um, but this is the only drug that controls their seizures. Uh, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very difficult drug to deal with. Uh, what, what I said, that I'm impressed how kids with uncontrolled seizures just are developmentally stalled or regressed. They're in a vegetative state. I mean, and they're, they're, if you can't get the seizures under control, uh, their life expectancy goes to the teens. So, so this is this is often the option that the parents have. So I, I find that the parents are com often very comfortable with the risks of vision yeah, loss because their child for the first time is developing, their brain is not seizing, and they're starting to hit milestones. And it's 
So it's, it is. Right. It's a very complicated situation. But, but then they say, but you can put glasses on and fix that, shit, right? Yeah. 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 And, and that's the, the issue because right. those. But this issue of, of, of having a brain that functions is is important, and it is a I agree a night and day difference. Dr. Warner. Uh, it, at uh, Nanos last year, um, one presentation Hello. discussed uh, a prospective trial of um, Vigatrin okay. and uh, doing baseline prior to uh, taking the medication. And a, a very high percentage of the patients um, had abnormalities on RNFL, on electrophysiology, visual fields. And, uh, prior to. Prior to. Exactly. Right. And um, they, they, had, they had the study go on for a couple of years, and um, there were, they didn't see any statistically significant changes in visual fields um, or RNFL. Maybe the RNFL actually increased a little bit, um, and no patients had loss of acuity. Uh, one patient developed visual field constriction. So, I mean, I think that, I think that that sort of called into question, because a lot of the studies are done way later after yes. the exposure, yes. and it's, you know, understandably a lot of patients were very young in enrollment and couldn't have done a pre, you know, a pre-treatment extensive testing. Right. Uh, but it's been somewhat um, controversial as to the, really the frequency of how, how often this really occurs compared to the potential benefit of the drug. It, it's a tough call. We try to get pre-treatment testing you know, whenever possible. Um, in this situation we're in here, unusual for me, where I've never seen the child, the very first time I see them, they've A, been on it for a long time, supposedly been tested, and things don't look good. And we're trying to sort out whether it's old or new, which is exactly the case. And I, and I also think of the point of the syndrome kids who, uh, you know, there's, there's often a reason why they have intractable epilepsy and end up on uh, Vigabatrin, and may, that may definitely include a, a potential retinal issue that's related to their underlying yes. disorder rather than their well, drug. I'll bring additional info back. Yeah. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, just as a plug, we do have a genetic counselor that we're hiring <laughs> as of July 1st. You need to do genetic testing on a patient like this because you're bringing up the idea could this be a retinal dystrophy? And yes. A retinal dystrophy plus a toxic drug, you can get all sorts of bizarre yes. things. And the genetic testing prices are coming down, so compared to a lot of other testing you're doing, it's the same. You're in the same ballpark now. It's, and, uh, we're def they're already they're plugged into genetics yeah. already, and, and and hopefully we'll get some sort of answer in terms of an overall better overall diagnosis. All right, next, moving on, number three. Oh, Dr. Young. Dr. Young's going to talk to us about a very interesting patient. Um, that, that led both of us, I think, initially. Um, so I'm going to present a case of a kid I actually just saw in clinic last week, uh, Tuesday, and the kid came in and I kind of started to discuss it quickly with uh, Bob, and he said, oh, you should present that case. So. This is a uh, six-month-old kid who was in my uh, 9.30 slot last uh, Tuesday, um, came in because uh, he had some left orbital swelling. Um, he had been treated by his primary care doctor with a course of Augmentin. After he'd been on that about two days, mom felt like it got worse, and she went to the emergency department where... Um, they saw him and said he has a little bit of injection of his conjunctiva, some swelling with erythema of the upper lid, thought the pupils were equal and reactive to light. They thought he looked around, looked fine, told him to go home and come back and uh, see his primary care doctor in two days um, or uh, follow up with them if things got worse. But nothing got better, uh, and so they were a little bit concerned and talked to their primary care doctor and decided that they needed to come see ophthalmology. Uh, his past history is pretty insignificant. He was born full term. There was no family history of any eye problems, no past medical history. On exam in the clinic, he would uh, follow things with his right eye, but would not follow anything with his left eye and got mad when you covered his right eye. His pupil on the right was round and reacted. The left, I had a hard time seeing, but it certainly didn't seem to move at all. 
His uh, pressure was normal in each eye, which I was able to get with the eye care. He had pretty small palpebral fissures. Um, he was a half Asian kid, so he didn't open either eye a lot, but the left eye barely opened at all. Um, the anterior segment exam on the right eye was clear. When I could get the left eye open, he had a very, not a very, but he had a hazy central cornea there, um, and it was difficult for me to look at the anterior chamber. So at this point, I was a little bit concerned that he had kind of a fuller, it didn't look so much like a swollen orbit to me, but it, it made me concerned that mom was saying that it was swollen. Um, what, what's going on here? Uh, that in addition to um, an eye with a cloudy cornea that I can't see to the back, um, couldn't really dilate the pupil and the pupil was unresponsive. The bad thing that I was really worried about was, is this retinoblastoma with extraocular extension? And that's why he's got some orbital changes. Um, you know, mom said it kind of comes and goes I looked at her phone and it didn't look like it, it, you know, she said it wasn't there right after birth but had come later and I was wondering if maybe this could be something like a lymphangioma which, you know, has kind of a course that comes and goes but that didn't really uh, uh, go with the cloudy cornea. Could this be a tumor like a rhabdomyosarcoma, something, uh, something else that's very worrisome but always thinking of? Dermoid cyst, we see these commonly but that also wouldn't go with the uh, cloudy cornea nor would congenital ptosis. Always think about congenital glaucoma in any infant you see with a cloudy cornea, but his pressures were normal, and that kind of rules that out in a kid. Um, or is this a retinal detachment with the pre eye and that, uh, you know, maybe it's not really a swollen orbit, maybe it's just a small eye that, that doesn't open up as much. I was thinking about those things while I was letting the kid dilate, and uh, I took a brief look at the dilated exam in that right eye and thought it looked pretty normal, but was quite concerned about the left eye. I uh, couldn't get a view at all, couldn't get that pupil to dilate at all, and fortunately that day I was at primary, so I was able to send him over to see Dr. Harry for an ultrasound, which showed a total retinal detachment. And interestingly, uh, an axial length in the normal eye of 20 millimeters and an axial length in the left eye of 14 millimeters. So I thought, oh, this is PHPV. This is a smaller eye with a retinal detachment, you know, just maybe a little bit of a, uh, and, and the eye is smaller, so it just doesn't open as much. This, you know, doesn't have anything to do with um, it being swollen at all. Um, and kind of started to talk to the family a little bit about it. Um, they were understandably quite upset, um, but I also recommended that we do an exam under anesthesia just to get a really good look at the right eye to make sure we weren't missing anything else, but I was pretty sure this was what was going on. Um, they were quite concerned that we, you know, although there was a retinal detachment here, that I didn't think we could fix that retinal detachment, but I said, let's just get an EUA, I have OR time tomorrow, and then we can have a better idea of things. So we put the kid under anesthesia here, and these aren't the greatest photos, but the right eye has a nice clear cornea. The left eye, um, and a normal anterior segment, the left eye here, there's a haze here in the middle. The pupil is, you know, about a millimeter big, and um, the iris is all the way up to the uh, endothelium, and I think that's why the cornea is cloudy. It's just starting to... the anterior segment doesn't look particularly good. It doesn't look like a no. cornea. No, no. The anterior segment actually looks pretty normal. It's just that the, the, there's, no, there's no AC. There's it's about a half millimeter difference in corneal diameter in the OR. Uh, yeah, not, the, not. It tracked the pressure, so Nor, yeah, it was 17, normal. Yeah, pressures were normal. And we rechecked it in the OR and it was, it was even less. It was like 13 and 11 or something like that. Very normal. Um, I took a picture of the kid under anesthesia and you can see, see that uh, this was at the end of the case, but apart from the lid speculum marks, it doesn't really look like a swollen eye. It more looks like, you know, it's, the orbital swelling was just kind of a red herring. This is just a smaller eye that doesn't open as much. We also did some electro uh, physiology and electro uh, ERGs here, and you can see that in the right eye, looks pretty normal. Uh, single flash here in the left eye, almost nothing. And uh, VEP is, uh, you know, very abnormal as well. Um, so at this point, we were, uh, you know, I was, we kind of looked around inside the eye and um, taking a little closer look now that the kid's under anesthesia. And, you know, Bob and I both took a look here and we could see that there was this depigmented area here, which made us a little bit uh, uh, 
take a little pause and, and think a little bit more about what's going on with the retina. Also, if you look you know, a little more closely here, you can see that the vessels don't seem to completely go all the way out to the edge. But at this point, we were you know, still kind of thinking about it and kind of still thought it was uh, PHPV until we got in the fluorescein. And Glenn was nice enough to come over at the very last minute and do a fluorescein for us. But you can see very nicely, which I don't know, you can't, the lights are on a little bit here, but. Um, this showed up much better on my computer. Yeah, if we can hit those lights off here. I wonder if we can blow this picture up at all. Whoops. It shows up much better on my screen here, but the vascular retina ends right here. Um, and this all branches out into fans, which showed up much nicer on my computer here. But um, pretty, and uh, as well down here, you can see a little bit, it just ends right here. <coughs> You're, yeah, oh. yeah. Very oh. dramatic. Very Peripheral dramatic. Uh, vascular areas in that eye. So pretty clearly looks like something like fever now, um, which we were completely thrown off until, you know, did this under anesthesia. If it does, there's no leak, you know, these are the later frames here at, at two minutes. There doesn't seem to be any leakage. It's just all peripheral avascular retina here. And you can see it just kind of fans here into a, uh, you know, ear pattern looking here. So um, very glad, you know, you can also see it up here as well. We put this kid under anesthesia to kind of answer that question a little bit better. So um, just to talk a little bit about fever, which is something I've, didn't see so much in residency or fellowship, but I've seen uh, a couple of cases and picked up on a few cases uh, as an attending. It's uh, characterized by peripheral avascular retina in patients without a history of uh, retinopathy of prematurity. It really kind of looks like ROP. Um, can be very asymmetric and has variable patterns of inheritance and penetrance. This is actually one of my um, patients here who had kind of a similar story. Uh, born with a retinal detachment in the other eye. This eye actually um, was initially doing much better and then, you know, just suddenly took a turn for the worse, uh, you know, when the kid was a couple of years old and, and started pulling more and more and more, although she had, you know, many times been lasered. Um, so, so certainly can have a course that's very unpredictable and can change, uh, change very, very rapidly. Um, there's a paper in ophthalmology in 2014 done by Mike Tracy's group that suggests that there, the prevalence of fever is, is, is quite underestimated. They looked at uh, 74 subjects of 17 families and found that a, there were 58 percent of asymptomatic family members had stage 1 or 2 fever and 21 percent had stage 3, 4, or 5. Um, so our patient would be a stage 1 just because they uh, just have peripheral vascular avascular retina. Stage two is, you know, when they start to have, uh, you know, some can start to have some exudate and uh, a little bit more concerning. So 35% of these asymptomatic people had stage two, which is kind of that stage that can really take a turn um, and, and start uh, causing a lot of problems in terms of uh, retinal detachment and macular dragging and things like that. So the question for me is, how do you pick up on these kids, you know, when you see them in clinic and when can you identify them? I mean, this is one of the few retinal dystrophies that we can do something about and we can prevent vision loss. Um, uh, so what are things we look for? We can look for straightened vessels. Um, we can uh, ask about a family history, but that's not always uh, so much so helpful unless it's positive. If it's negative, it doesn't really help rule, rule, rule this out. Um, we can look for some vit vitreous opacities or things. This is actually one of my other patients who uh, was seen by another pediatric ophthalmologist in town. He had a little bit of nystagmus, had a Chiari 1 malformation, had actually seen Neurop at one time for his nystagmus and his Chiari and questions about whether they wanted to decompress that. He came to my clinic because uh, the other pediatric, he had a head turn and they were considering doing a Keston bomb. So they came to me for a question of uh, whether we should do surgery for the Keston bomb. And I said, well, what, what is your ophthalmologist or what have people said in the past about that? 
tuft of vitreous that's in this, you know, right over his optic nerve, and the family said, well, we don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I sent this patient up to Emmy, and it turns out this kid has fever. Um, and the nystagmus was probably due to the Chiari, and he probably had both things, but he ended up getting some laser in the periphery. Um, vertical strabismus, I have a couple of fever kids that have kind of funny vertical strabismus, but we often see that too in kids who are dragged in um, uh, ROP. So these are kind of some things that I kind of think about um, when I'm looking for these kids. Um, the other thing that, you know, is a huge part of our exam, sometimes the biggest part of our exam, is the retinoscopy. And so uh, I always kind of think about uh, when I see kids with really high refractive error. Oh, sorry, this should be mine. Yeah. Uh, do these kids have fever? I have a couple of kids with fever who have really asymmetric. You know, this is a case report that was actually written by my mentor at Boston Children's where they, um, it was published in 99. But looking at, you know, this kid who had some anisometropia, and this is actually the eye with the worst fever, and they conjectured that maybe um, the disease could be associated with this axial myopia. I have seen this in a few cases. I have at least one kid who's a minus nine with fever in one eye and nothing in the other eye. Uh, but I also, you know, this other kid here is, that I showed is, uh, you know, Plano in each eye. So certainly doesn't always have to be that. Um, also, high myopia, kids with really high myopia, I, I, I kind of wonder about that as well. This is a, there was a Taiwanese study that was published uh, in 2002 that looked at kids and said that all of them, had, it looked at uh, nine patients actually with uh, fever that they saw consecutively in their clinic, and all of them had myopia of greater than five diopters by age eight. Um, this is another kid I saw who came into my clinic just after failing a vision screening, and um, maybe a little bit of straightening. This is from his first EUA, but he was 19 months old and had this refractive error. Also had a little bit of exudate here, and I sent this kid up to Emmy and ended up having fever uh, as well. So um, bottom line is I think it's a lot more common, and I think sometimes we miss it, and I think, um, you know, it is something that we can do something about. Some of these really sad cases, like, uh, you know, it, it can cause devastating vision loss, but I think, uh, I think we're missing some of these cases. It's, you know, this is the re one of the reasons I'm so glad we have our pediatric retina service in Dr. Hartnett. I mean, the issue with this case that she presented is that without knowing the diagnosis, this child's only eye is a significant risk of vision loss. We're going to go back and do a combined EUA with pediatric retina service. That eye will probably get uh, laser treatment to the avascular retina. So this is making a big difference. And these are cases, it was tough to sort this out, that we likely would have missed years ago. And so I think that this is a clear case where having a, a you know, pediatric retina specialist has brought this disorder into our consciousness and made us a lot more aware of it. So, maybe questions yes. on the, in the left eye? Yes. Is the feeding, this was bilateral fever? Or there, yes. Was there, yes. Was there PHP? No, no, I think so it's... is fever sometimes associated with that marked difference in regards to uh, overall globe size? I don't know the answer to that. If, if, I mean, once you have the retinal, this is an eye that probably didn't thrive, it had a, a retinal detachment very early on so, okay. in, 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 in vascular we development. We know that can affect globe growth. So and I, that's what I attributed the, the, the very short eye to, was that it had probably, and we don't have a prenatal ultrasound, what would be fascinating is if they had one to go back and look and see at what point in development. So this thing could have attached, attached potentially even in utero. Oh, I think it did. Yeah, oh, it did. I think it did. In the utero. So, that's what we would I think it's a, the size difference. Too. I think it's a pretty tight funnel in there. I think it's been there a long time. So uh, the other thing you're telling is you look at these signs, but it sounds like in these mild cases, the only way you can know for sure is a fluorescein angiography. Am I, am I not right? No, you're correct. That's right. I mean, if you had a fluorescein angiography, no, and I almost did it because to me it looked pretty like a like it looked like a PHPV to me, you know, and that with especially with the globe size, I almost didn't do one. But then I just kind of been thinking, and I've seen kind of I have a collection of these fever kids now, and I'm thinking about it more and more. Um, so yeah. Because yeah. even in the OR, looking at the peripheral retina, she and I agreed something isn't quite right here. Let's get an FA, and the FA. Night and day difference. So it was just that one deep pigmented area, and then the vessel. It just looked a little funny, but not really straightened. I mean, right. you can. It, it didn't. It, it's not advanced enough. Yeah. So, good case. Sorry, I wish the FA had shown up better. This is great. Thank you very much. Next.
we're going to hear from Dr. Owen, who's going to talk to us about uh, New onset, new onset isotropia. Sorry, lost we, on the list. No, that's Thank okay. You. We only have a few minutes, so I'll just go through kind of quickly. Um, I don't want to delay anybody today. Um, the patient that I'm presenting was a previously healthy two-year-old girl. She was born full term, no prior medical problems, um, not a patient of our clinic previously. She was initially presenting um, to the pediatric ophthalmology clinic from the primary children's ER. And she was seen there after a chair fell on her head. And the chief complaint in the ER, she had new right eye crossing with a face turn, and it was after this unwitnessed blunt trauma to the head. She did not lose consciousness. When she was evaluated in the ED, which was the, uh, initially the day after her trauma, she was sent home without intervention. She then represented to the ER several days later because her parents were concerned that her eye was still crossing, her face was still turning, they didn't understand why this was the case. At that time, we were consulted. We, dem um, we documented a right esotropia, but a normal dilated exam, and the recommendation was made just to follow up as an outpatient. And so I saw this child six days after the initial injury in my clinic. And to highlight some of the pertinent parts of the exam, this was a two-year-old child not reading the eye chart, but did have normal um, tracking abilities in each eye. Um, but on her strabismus exam, you can hopefully see, it's a little small, I, I apologize. She has a right esotropia that is greater at distance. It's 25 at near, but 35 at distance. Um, it's also incompetent on my exam, um, which is probably why she has at least a 30 degree head turn to get her eyes into the left gaze position where you can see she no longer has a right ET. And I did document adduction limitation. Um, in the ER, uh, our evaluation felt like there was no adduction limitation. Um, but she did have the face turn at that time, which uh, is kind of a red flag for a, an incompetent esotropia or eye misalignment of any kind. Um, because generally, you know, a new onset face turn, the, why would anyone do that um, <laughs> to keep their eyes straight? And so that must mean there's some position where their eyes are straight. And by definition, that means it's not comitant. Because in a comitant deviation, the eye misalignment is the same in all directions of gaze. Therefore, there would not be a position, a head position, that would be advantageous, at least, to give you binocular vision. So these things were concerning to me. Um, uh, the rest of her exam was fairly non-focal. She didn't have optic nerve edema. Her, her dilated exam, I agreed, was normal. And she really didn't have a significant refractive error. She wasn't a high hyperope. So I recommended that we scan her. And the radiologist read is going to be most informative, more so than my impressions. But essentially, I thought that was his computer. Um, <laughs> that the radiologist was coming to us. All right, so um, they found this, these um, flare hyperintensities that were bilateral. Um, they uh, had a specific pattern in the white matter. They didn't notice volume loss, but they really, they, they essentially called this a picture of leukomalacia, but they weren't quite sure. It didn't, it didn't um, look like anything in, that they could call specifically from the MRI, but it wasn't normal. The other thing that was really interesting to me is that they didn't feel like it looked very acute. I mean, we were imaging her because this all happened after what I found out from the mom was that a chair that was sitting up on a table, she pulled it off onto herself in the kitchen. And, um, you know, so, so I expected to maybe see an acute finding, um, but this, this didn't seem acute. Uh, so it was really interesting and perplexing, and 
I thought a neurologist would be better able to evaluate it. So I referred them to neurology, and their findings, they did find um, uh, a right six cranial nerve palsy, which is what prompted everything in the first place. She was maintaining her head position when she saw them in clinic, but they didn't notice any other neurologic deficits in their clinic. Um, they were specifically looking, it sounds like, for things like spasticity uh, that, that they didn't find. She, they felt uh, that they were in agreement with her pediatrician and her parents, that she'd been meeting all of her developmental milestones. They, they really could find no clinical uh, evidence that would uh, coincide with her MRI findings. And they also said they can't tell if the white matter injury to her brain is old or new. So it was really kind of perplexing. Their plan was to watch her carefully. Um, they're gonna repeat a brain MRI in three months. It has not yet been three months um, since this was done. Sooner if she develops any other motor deficits. And then they're also doing some blood analysis to look for uh, things associated with different leukodystrophies because their main concern was this thing called vanishing white matter disease that I had not previously heard of. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think the salient points and the reason I wanted to present this is that um, when we see new esotropia in a child, we never know if it's, if they had a tendency previously that was unrecognized and that they now their, their disease process has worsened and this is just a manifestation of something that was already present or if this is truly a new phenomenon. And it has implications for what the cause is and, and if we should image the child, if we should look for any concerning underlying etiologies. So some things to watch out for, if it's an incompetent esotropia, that's a big red flag that this should be imaged. Um, and it can be difficult in a two-year-old child to, to ensure that all of their ductions are completely full, especially in an ER setting. And so some things that can, is certainly a duction limitation is going to help you determine if it's incompetent, but a new head posture, as we discussed earlier, is also a sign, even if you can't fully evaluate the ductions or, or feel like you might not be getting a, a true picture, if they have a new gaze position, a preferred gaze position, that is a red flag. Um, in the setting of eye misalignment, it's a red flag for an incompetent eye misalignment. But if there is no eye misalignment, but they still have a new gaze preference, that's still worrisome. They could have a new homonymous hemianopsia or something like that. So anytime a child has a new head posture, it should be a cause for concern. And especially in the setting of trauma. You know, even if you feel like the parents are poor historians, they don't know what they're talking about, this probably has been going on forever. In the setting of a trauma, you have to give the benefit of the doubt to the parents, I think. Um, and so, you know, what if this was actually a cometent esotropia, as I think was initially thought? Well, there's some guidelines for this, which we don't need to go into in depth, but people have studied this, and even a cometent, a new onset, uh, a cometent, Cometent esotropia can be cause for, for concern. And um, they found in their study that out of these 48 children that presented with an acute cometent esotropia, that about 6% did have uh, an intracranial process that would account for that. And the things that were red flag flags in a cometent deviation were larger angle at distance than near, which really suggests possibly a cranial nerve 6 etiology that's really un, uh, unnoticed because that pattern, um, because uh, the lateral rectus muscles, which are innervated by the, crani the sixth cranial nerve, are more um, important at distance and have more activity, we think. Um, so, so common because it's bilateral? Cometent meaning it's the same in all gaze directions. Is the reason why a sixth would be cometent is because you've got both? I think it might have been missed. If there's truly a, a distance near disparity, it may be a missed sixth and they may be calling it competent when it might be. Oh, it really is. Yeah. Um, but obviously if the child has neurologic signs, symptoms, they included optic nerve edema in this. If they have recurrence, like it gets better and then it comes back, 
um, or if they're older than six years of age at the time they present. Those are the, the things that correlated in their study with uh, intracranial pathology causing the deviation. So even in a comitant esotropia that's new, um, there can be a reason to image those kids, and those are some of the things to look for. So what do we know about vanishing white matter disease, and why would that be causing this sixth nerve palsy, and how is it related to the chair falling on her head? Well, we don't know for certain that she has this, but I think the reason neurology suspects it is that it is a stress-induced leukomalacia, and the MRI was uh, substantiating the fact that this child had a leukomalacia. The chair, they feel like, could have been the stress uh, that caused this chain of events you can see here that there is, uh, we won't go into detail, but there is a molecular rationale for why stress could potentiate this disease process. But essentially, these children, like our patient, um, if, they, if this is an early childhood onset form of the disease, they do tend to develop normally. They ha may have some mild motor or speech delays, um, but, but they can be completely normal until you see evidence after a trauma of something like uh, you know, any neurologic deficit. In ours, it was the sixth nerve, but it can be ataxia or spasticity. Um, and you can see that there is some, some concern for life expectancy. It's an awful disease, you read that. Yeah, we yeah. won't go in. It, it is an awful disease, and it's really hard to fathom considering that she's a cute, normal two-year-old right now. Um, and so for me, this is a conundrum because how do I treat her? Her head is like this, and so that is not sustainable. Uh, you know, it's um, for long term, but uh, it is allowing her to maintain binocularity, which is one of our goals, so I like that. Um, I don't know how she would respond to strabismus surgery um, for a couple of reasons. Would strabismus surgery stress her in, the, in, in a way that could potentiate her disease progression? Otherwise, I don't know, and I wouldn't want, and it, it might not just be relative to the eyes, it could potentiate other, you know, manifestations of the disease, which I would not want to do. I don't, I mean, she's currently binocular, even though she's got this giant head turn, you know, I don't, I don't want to make things worse for her. And then, would she respond normally to our traditional strabismus dosing and techniques because her neurologic system is not normal and that's what's causing this. You know, often in our, you know, accommodative esotropes or partially accommodative esotropes, if we're doing surgery on them, we feel like the innervation is fairly normal, the muscles are fairly normal, um, so we have some framework to, to believe that they're going to predictably or somewhat predictably respond to our surgical dosage, but in circumstances where the muscles are abnormal, the innervation's abnormal, they don't respond as reliably and, um, you know, would a surgery be able to allow her to maintain a straight eye position? Would it be worth it to do that? I don't know. So um, we're kind of working through this now with neurology and with the family, but any thoughts would be appreciated.